Chapter 15 of The History of Genghis Khan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Johns, Salt Lake City, Utah. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 15 The Story of Hujaku. 1211. China. The Chinese Wall. The accounts given us of the events and transaction of Genghis Khan's reign after he acquired the supreme power over the Mongol and Tartar nations are imperfect, and in many respects confused. It appears, however, from them that in the year 1211, that is about five years after his election as Grand Khan, he became involved in a war with the Chinese, which led in the end to very important consequences. The kingdom of China lay to the southward of the Mongol territories, and the frontier was defended by the famous Chinese Wall, which extended from east to west, over hills and valleys, from the great desert to the sea, for many hundred miles. The wall was defended by towers, built here and there, in commanding positions along the whole extent of it, and at certain distances there were fortified towns where powerful garrisons were stationed, and reserves of troops were held ready to be marched to different points along the wall wherever there might be occasion for their services. The Frontier The wall was not strictly the Chinese frontier, for the territory on the outside of it, to a considerable distance, was held by the Chinese government, and there were many large towns and some very strong fortresses in this outlying region, all of which were held and garrisoned by Chinese troops. Outside the Wall The inhabitants, however, of the countries outside the Wall were generally of the Tartar or Mongol race. They were of a nation or tribe called the Kitten, and were somewhat inclined to rebel against the Chinese rule. In order to assist in keeping them in subjection, one of the Chinese emperors issued a decree which ordained that the governors of those provinces should place in all the large towns and other strongholds outside the wall twice as many families of the Chinese as there were of the kitten. This regulation greatly increased the discontent of the kitten and made them more inclined to rebellion than they were before. Origin of the Quarrel with the Chinese Yang Si Besides this, there had been for some time a growing difficulty between the Chinese government and Genghis Khan. It seems that the Mongols had been for a long time accustomed to pay some sort of tribute to the emperor of China, and many years before, while Genghis Khan, under the name of Temujin, was living at Karakoram, a subject of Vang Khan, the emperor sent a certain royal prince named Yang Si to receive what was due. While Yang Si was in the Mongol territory, he and Temujin met, but they did not agree together at all. The Chinese prince put some slight upon Temujin, which Temujin resented. Very likely Temujin, whose character at that time, as well as afterward, was marked with a great deal of pride and spirit, opposed the payment of the tribute. At any rate, Yang Si became very much incensed against him, and on his return made serious charges against him to the emperor, and urged that he should be seized and put to death. But the emperor declined engaging in so dangerous an undertaking. Yang Si's proposal, however, became known to Temujin, and he secretly resolved that he would one day have his revenge. At length, about three or four years after Temujin, was raised to the throne, the emperor of the Chinese died, and Yang Si succeeded him. The very next year, he sent an officer to Genghis Khan to demand the usual tribute. When the officer came into the presence of Genghis Khan in his camp and made his demand, Genghis Khan asked him who was the emperor that had sent him with such a message. The officer replied that Yang Si was at that time emperor of the Chinese. Genghis Khan's contempt for him. Yang Si, repeated Genghis Khan in a tone of great contempt. The Chinese have a proverb, he added, 
that such a people as they ought to have a god for their emperor but it seems they do not know how to choose even a decent man it was true that they had such a proverb they were as remarkable it seems in those days as they are now for their national self-importance and vanity go and tell your emperor added genghis khan that i am a sovereign ruler and that i will never acknowledge him as my master armies raised hujaku when the messenger returned with this defiant answer yang si was very much enraged and immediately began to prepare for war genghis khan also at once commenced his preparations he sent envoys to the leading khans who occupied the territories outside the wall inviting them to join him he raised a great army and put the several divisions of it under the charge of his ablest generals yang si raised a great army too the historians say that it amounted to three hundred thousand men he put this army under the command of a great general named hujaku and ordered him to advance with it to the northward so as to intercept the army of genghis khan on its way and to defend the wall and the fortresses on the outside of it from his attacks many of the khans come over on genghis's side in the campaign which ensued genghis khan was most successful the mongols took possession of a great many towns and fortresses beyond the wall and every victory that they gained made the tribes and nations that inhabited those provinces more and more disposed to join them many of them revolted against the chinese authority and turned to their side one of these was a chieftain so powerful that he commanded an army of one hundred thousand men in order to bind himself solemnly to the covenant which he was to make with genghis khan he ascended a mountain in company with the envoy and with others who were to witness the proceedings and there performed the ceremony customary on such occasions the ceremony consisted of sacrificing a white horse and a black ox and then breaking an arrow at the same time pronouncing an oath by which he bound himself under the most solemn sanctions to be faithful to genghis khan to reward the prince for this act of adhesion to his cause genghis khan made him king over all that portion of the country and caused him to be everywhere so proclaimed this encouraged a great many other khans and chieftains to come over to his side and at length one who had the command of one of the gates of the great wall and of the fortress which defended it joined him by this means genghis khan obtained access to the interior of the chinese dominions and yang si and his great general hujaku became seriously alarmed victory over hujaku at length after various marchings and countermarchings genghis khan learned that hujaku was encamped with the whole of his army in a very strong position at the foot of a mountain and he determined to proceed thither and attack him he did so and the result of the battle was that hujaku was beaten and was forced to retreat he retired to a great fortified town and genghis khan followed him and laid siege to the town hujaku finding himself in imminent danger fled and genghis khan was on the point of taking the town when he was suddenly stopped in his career by being one day wounded severely by an arrow which was shot at him from the wall genghis khan is wounded the wound was so severe that while suffering under it genghis khan found that he could not successfully direct the operations of the army and so he withdrew his troops and retired into his own country to wait there until his wound should be healed in a few months he was entirely recovered and the next year he fitted out a new expedition and advanced again into china hujaku disgraced in the meantime hujaku who had been repeatedly defeated and driven back the year before by genghis khan had fallen into disgrace his rivals and enemies among the other generals of the army and among the officers of the court conspired against him and represented to the emperor that he was unfit to command and that his having failed to defend the towns and the country 
that had been committed to him was owing to his cowardice and incapacity in consequence of these representations hujaku was cashiered that is dismissed from his command in disgrace restored again this made him very angry and he determined that he would have his revenge there was a large party in his favor at court as well as a party against him and after a long and bitter contention the former once more prevailed and induced the emperor to restore hujaku to his command again dissensions among the chinese the quarrel however was not ended and so when genghis khan came the next year to renew the invasion the councils of the chinese were so distracted and their operations so paralyzed by this feud that he gained very easy victories over them the chinese generals instead of acting together in a harmonious manner against the common enemy were intent only on the quarrel which they were waging against each other at length the animosity proceeded to such an extreme that hujaku resolved to depose the emperor who seemed inclined rather to take part against him assassinate all the chiefs of the opposite party and then finally to put the emperor to death and cause himself to be proclaimed in his stead advance of the mongols in order to prepare the way for the execution of this scheme he forbore to act vigorously against genghis khan and the mongols but allowed them to advance farther and farther into the country this of course increased the general discontent and excitement and prepared the way for the revolt which hujaku was plotting hujaku's rebellion death of yang si at length the time for action arrived hujaku suddenly appeared at the head of a large force at the gates of the capital and gave the alarm that the mongols were coming he pressed forward into the city to the palace and gave the alarm there at the same time files of soldiers whom he had ordered to this service went to all parts of the city arresting and putting to death all the leaders of the party opposed to him under pretense that he had discovered a plot or conspiracy in which they were engaged to betray the city to the enemy the excitement and confusion which was produced by this charge and by the alarm occasioned by the supposed coming of the mongols so paralyzed the authorities of the town that nobody resisted hujaku or attempted to save the persons whom he arrested some of them he caused to be killed on the spot others he shut up in prison finding himself thus undisputed master of the city he next took possession of the palace seized the emperor deposed him from his office and shut him up in a dungeon soon afterward he put him to death this was the end of yang si but hujaku did not succeed after all in his design of causing himself to be proclaimed emperor in his stead he found that there would be very great opposition to this and so he gave up this part of his plan and finally raised a certain prince of the royal family to the throne while he retained his office of commander-in-chief of the forces having thus as he thought effectually destroyed the influence and power of his enemies at the capital he put himself once more at the head of his troops and went forth to meet genghis khan hujaku advances some accident happened to him about this time by which his foot was hurt so that he was in some degree disabled but still he went on at length he met the vanguard of genghis khan's army at a place where they were attempting to cross a river by a bridge hujaku determined immediately to attack them the state of his foot was such that he could not walk or even mount a horse but he caused himself to be put upon a sort of car and was by this means carried into the battle the battle hujaku's victory the mongols were completely defeated and driven back perhaps this was because genghis khan was not there to command them he was at some distance in the rear with the main body of the army hujaku was very desirous of following up his victory by pursuing and attacking the mongol vanguard the next day he could not however do this personally 
for on account of the excitement and exposure which he had endured in the battle and the rough movements and joltings which notwithstanding all his care he had to bear in being conveyed to and fro about the field his foot grew much worse inflammation set in during the night and the next day the wound opened afresh so he was obliged to give up the idea of going out himself against the enemy and to send one of his generals instead the general to whom he gave the command was named khan ki khan ki's expedition failure hujaku enraged khan ki went out against the enemy but after a time returned unsuccessful hujaku was very angry with him when he came to hear his report perhaps the wound in his foot made him impatient and unreasonable at any rate he declared that the cause of khan ki's failure was his dilatoriness in pursuing the enemy which was cowardice or treachery and in either case he deserved to suffer death for it he immediately sent to the emperor a report of the case asking that the sentence of death which he had pronounced against khan ki might be confirmed and that he might be authorized to put it into execution but the emperor knowing that khan ki was a courageous and faithful officer would not consent in the meanwhile before the emperor's answer came back the wrath of hujaku had had time to cool a little accordingly when he received the answer he said to khan ki that he would after all try him once more take the command of the troops again said he and go out against the enemy if you beat them i will overlook your first offence and spare your life but if you are beaten yourself a second time you shall die khan ki's second trial the sandstorm so khan ki placed himself at the head of his detachment and went out again to attack the mongols they were to the northward and were posted it seems upon or near a sandy plain at any rate a strong north wind began to blow at the time when the attack commenced and blew the sand and dust into the eyes of his soldiers so that they could not see while their enemies the mongols having their backs to the wind were very little incommoded the result was that khan ki was repulsed with considerable loss and was obliged to make the best of his way back to hujaku's quarters to save the remainder of his men khan ki's desperate resolution he now was desperate hujaku had declared that if he came back without having gained a victory he should die and he had no doubt that the man was violent and reckless enough to keep his word he determined not to submit he might as well die fighting he thought at the head of his troops as to be ignobly put to death by hujaku's executioner so he arranged it with his troops who probably hated hujaku as much as he did that on returning to the town they should march in under arms take possession of the place surround the palace and seize the general and make him prisoner or kill him if he should attempt any resistance the attack hujaku's flight he is killed in the gardens the troops accordingly when they arrived at the gates of the town seized and disarmed the guards and then marched in brandishing their weapons and uttering loud shouts and outcries which excited first a feeling of astonishment and then of terror among the inhabitants the alarm soon spread to the palace indeed the troops themselves soon reached and surrounded the palace and began thundering at the gates to gain admission they soon forced their way in hujaku in the meantime terrified and panic-stricken had fled from the palace into the gardens in hopes to make his escape by the garden walls the soldiers pursued him in his excitement and agitation he leaped down from a wall too high for such a descent and in the fall broke his leg he lay writhing helplessly on the ground when the soldiers came up they were wild and furious with the excitement of pursuit and they killed him with their spears where he lay khan ki took the head of his old enemy and carried it to the capital with the intention of offering it to the emperor and also of surrendering himself to the officers of justice in order as he said that he might be put to death 
for the crime of which he had been guilty in heading a military revolt and killing his superior officer by all the laws of war this was a most heinous and a wholly unpardonable offence khan ki is pardoned and promoted but the emperor was heartily glad that the turbulent and unmanageable old general was put out of the way for a man so unprincipled so ambitious and so reckless as hujaku was is always an object of aversion and terror to all who have anything to do with him the emperor accordingly issued a proclamation in which he declared that hujaku had been justly put to death in punishment for many crimes which he had committed and soon afterward he appointed khan ki commander-in-chief of the forces in his stead End of chapter fifteen